Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, adversity can sometimes get us, but this morning, you folks online might not be able to see this. We've got a fireplace in our sanctuary now. Yeah. It's a heater. Our, our HVAC went out, um, and supply chain is going to keep that down a little bit. So uh, we are very thankful that uh, Pastor Mark and Lori had uh, a couple of heaters they could bring in and warm up our space with for us this morning. Uh, just some uh, announcements this morning before we get going. Uh, first of all, uh, we start the Truth Project. Talk about supply chain. Mark had uh, tried to order the, the materials for it, and all of a sudden he got, he, I get another text, it's on back order. And then we got together and we were meeting, and he said, guess what? They sent us the digital copies so we can print our own, so we can get started and have enough materials for everybody. So God is good. Um, then that's Wednesday night. And this this a fast couple of weeks here. Um, Saturday night at six o'clock, doors open at five thirty. We've got the free movie breakthrough. So if you haven't, or if you've run out of tickets to hand out to everybody, there's plenty more over there. Go ahead and grab some and uh, hand those out. Make sure we can fill this place up. We'll be transforming everything. We're set this way. Everything will be over there with that twelve foot screen that we have. So plenty of free popcorn, uh, drinks, hot dogs. Maybe even a brownie bite or two. So be sure to join us for that. Uh, following that, the following Saturday is Orange Track. And so uh, we've got that coming up. We have some of these fun little cards that you can take. I actually keep some of these in my pocket. And yesterday, we, Diane loves Jimmy John. So we were there. Not a plug. I'm not, we're no endorsement. But we were there. They have a community bullet board. I took a few of these out. There was an extra push pin. Band them out a little bit, pushed them into that community board, and just put them right up there. So, just an idea of what you can do to put things out. <laughs> and then last week, um, one of our members came up and said, Hey, can I take the rest of those BR guest cards? I got some people I want to give them to. I say, Yeah, great, do that. I know the guy that prints them. So, we have a whole bunch more of these now, too. <laughs> so, uh, be sure to grab those um, on your way out to hand out. Uh, they've got our QR code they can scan that takes them to a spot where they can see all the links on everything uh, for us for that so that's it for announcements um, this week like I said is a very busy week I'm just gonna throw things in the ground and we're all very thankful for all of you that are with us both in person today and online uh, those that could make it we are praying for you as some of them are traveling so we just thank God for the beautiful day that he's given us. Well, this morning we're going to go into uh, worship pretty much right away. Let's start with our call to worship this morning uh, to lead us into the message. Uh, Mark's message that God gave him this morning is entitled, Why Does Easter Matter? And the passage that he chose for us for our call to worship this morning is a very nice Three verse summary of why. But he's going to expound on that, help us to understand it more. But hear these words from the writer of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 8 and 10. It says, First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, this very first part is, is sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings. God didn't, didn't desire those. Those were not his permanent plan for our salvation, to, to rid us of our sins. But this one verse, chapter or verse 8 here, is a is actually a, a summary of all the Levitical laws. It tells us all about the sacrificial system. But again, that wasn't his permanent plan for us. In fact, 
verse 9, we get into it. Here I am, I have come to do your will. This is Jesus. Jesus came to do God's will. Jesus came to provide that permanent plan of salvation. And it's through his sacrifice on the cross that that Levitical plan wiped away. That we don't need that anymore. It's not required. God's will all along has been to make, make us holy. His purpose never changed. It was to make us holy. But because it couldn't be done through the Levitical sacrifices, he sent his son Jesus to us. And through that, we have been sanctified. And this isn't like changing your status on social media. Yeah, if people change their status on social media, they can do it every minute. But our status with God has been solidified by our faith. And in the sight of God, we are no longer tainted by our sin. I was reading uh, Joshua this week. And he's like, he's looking at the Israelis, he's going, when are you going to take possession of your land that you've been given? When are you going to do it? God is asking us, when are we going to take possession of this gift that he has given us? And not just take possession of it, but when are we going to open it up? When are we going to take that and make that a part of our daily lives? Father, as we prepare to hear the message that you've given to Pastor Mark, we just thank you for this word. We thank you that uh, he's going to answer a question that, uh, as Christians, we, we know but we need to be reminded of. And non-Christians, those who don't know you, Father, they need to hear this word as well. Thank you for giving us the technology that we can share this message with the world today. Father, be with Pastor Mark this morning. Let his words be yours. We thank you for all that you've done for Well, good morning, church. Is everybody having a great day? It's sunny outside somewhere. Uh, a little drizzly out today, a little gray. But then again, you know, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, we're all vertical somewhat. Some of us are sitting down. Um, but it's a great day. It's a great day in the Lord. And that's what we're here about today. And so the, the pastor's sermon that I came up with today, this really cool title is, Why Does Easter Matter? And so if you don't know, Easter is a season. It's not just a day, but it's a season. It actually lasts from Easter Sunday until Pentecost. So it's a 50-day run. That's what Pentecost means, is 50. That's what it stands for. So it's that 50-day season between Easter morning and Pentecost. And so during the Easter season, we're still talking about what's happening with us in our faith. And that's kind of where I'm at today. So today, as Terry alluded to, um, we're going to have law school. So <laughs> hopefully everybody brought their notebooks and you're ready to go. You're going to have your pens ready to take a few notes in here because we're, we're in law school today. So it should be kind of fun. Um, so a couple of, well, I think it was two or three sermons ago, I talked about a few things in here and what we've experienced in our lives and how these things kind of come back in and fill us. So if we remember back a few years ago, we all experienced Y2K, the disaster that never was. So in the years beginning up to and leading up to 2000, many firms brought in expensive engineers to millennial proof their computer systems. And so I remember going from Minneapolis to Madison, Wisconsin, to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, to Des Moines, and then back to Cedar Rapids. 
and I mean, it was a crazy time for me. I was going in there and I was patching systems and these are, uh, AM, well, Denny, you can appreciate this, AS400 systems. So I was doing Windows systems, I was doing AS400 systems in there. So I was doing kind of the full gamut, everything from small mini mainframes all the way down to desktop computers. And it was a lot of work. And I mean, it was, some of these things were very expensive and very extensive upgrades to the computer systems. And I was working mostly in the insurance and healthcare industry to do these things. So these were critical, what they termed critical infrastructure systems. And so it was a very, very, very busy time. And I remember sitting up and monitoring six different computer systems to make sure to catch any kind of fault condition that would happen. Um, and it was a very, very stressful time. And it was very tired. I mean, uh, you know, midday came and went, and I'm going, okay, what's gonna drop? Am I gonna have to go to Minneapolis or Sioux Falls or Madison, Wisconsin? Where am I gonna have to go? What am I gonna have to do? And it came and it went and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. And see, a lot of companies were preparing for the disaster. They were preparing, but some didn't. And all over the world, people were very, very, very nervous. And they were, I mean, this was a big thing. They were, uh, airlines shut down so they, they weren't flying in case the airplanes would drop out of the sky because the computer systems wouldn't work. Um, and so nobody knew for sure what was gonna happen or how it was gonna happen. And so many refused to travel even in or near the end of December of 1999. So as the clock clicked down to midnight, the world waited in anxious anticipation of a serious global consequence of what was gonna happen when all the computers kind of self-destructed on themselves. So like many others, I watched the live news programs which were monitoring the world for signs of that big millennium bug induced disaster. They never happened. They never happened. There were some tiny little incidents here and there, but it would be hard to describe as uh, slot machines failing in Delaware as a catastrophe. So this big disaster, this big thing that was to come was all built up. Everything, everybody was nervous, everybody was hyped up, but it turned out to be the disaster that never was. So if you remember, and if you were watching the TV like me, you watched these newscasters and they were just, you know, prepping for all this time of what was gonna happen and building the whole thing up and it was gonna be, you know, this monumental event. And then midnight went by and they were trying to find something to talk about because nothing happened. And they were testing their skills as far as how could they fill that void in space because they had literally nothing to talk about because Y2K was never a disaster, never a disaster. The whole world watched to see what was happening. And it was nothing. This was a moment when the trajectory of human history changed. There could be a future worth having for every person in the world. If we go back to our Easter story and we look at that in Luke 23, 44 through 49, it says, it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two and Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight of what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. So in my sermon a few weeks ago, I, I talked about some of our other recent history, and I alluded to that 
when I first started the sermon this morning, almost everyone who is alive at the time of President Kennedy's assassination in 1963 remembers where they were, what time it was, when they heard about that shooting and the death of our president. And for those who weren't alive back then, I mentioned 9-11, and the same thing held true. Major, in, major events that happened in our lives imprint themselves firmly in our minds. I can remember different things when I was going through and, and working with the Sheriff's Department and critical accidents and, and critical things that would happen and it would imprint itself in my mind and I could wake up months later or a year later and remember it in amazing detail because those kind of events imprint themselves into our mind. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all stipulate at the time when Jesus died, darkness began about noon. Jesus died at three in the afternoon. See, no one who was there will ever forget what happened. What they witnessed mattered. What they witnessed mattered. And so they went about writing about what had happened. And because they wrote so close to the time frame in which it happened, it becomes what is called critical, creditable evidence. Meaning, in the evidentiary screen that you have in a legal process, it means that this person saw it, they recorded it, it's accurate. We feel it's close enough to where it's going to be accurate. Now, we can fill a whole room full of people pop in an incident of some kind of, and we're all going to see it slightly different. So that's why the Gospels, you notice they have slight different take on what happened that day, but all of them agreed on those timelines. All of them agreed that Jesus died on the cross. All of them agreed what had happened, the major events that day, actually happened. So what could never be forgotten were the signs that came from God. When this happened, no other death in human history has been marked with such signs. <coughs> it turned dark at midday, dark as night, and it stayed that way. Mon something monumentous was taking place, and no us must think that the death of God's son was just another prophet who was suffering for his faith. No, this was more than that. This was different in so many ways. First, that sun had stopped shining, and there was darkness. Luke says the whole land went dark, which could mean everywhere in Israel, or just near the land of Jerusalem. The blackness certainly centered on the events that were happening at that point in time in Calvary. A few years ago, we had a major solar eclipse, and everybody was really eagerly anticipating what was going to happen, that blackout that was going to come. And it would be the closest thing that people would have to witness what happened at Calvary that day. And near the time, the birds suddenly became disturbed, and the wind increased, then suddenly there was darkness. But it wasn't nighttime darkness. But the light was only faint, the colors were subdued, the air was cold. Ten minutes later, there was light again. The winds diminished, the birds began to chirp, and all was normal. This is what happens in an eclipse. But that's not what happened that day at Calvary. The sun went dark. Everything was as dark as midnight at midday. What happened at Calvary was much, much more than that. For one thing, the darkness couldn't have been an eclipse because it happened at the time of Passover, and Passover took place at the full moon when an eclipse could not occur. And this darkness was no ordinary phenomenon. It was deeper. It lasted for hours. It was sent by God. It was sent by God. The second sign was that the curtain of the temple was torn in two, and Luke doesn't give more detail than that, but both Matthew and Mark say that it was torn from the top to the bottom. Those close by could see through the curtain and go through the curtain. The barrier was gone. The barrier was gone. 
So in my sermon a couple of weeks ago, I talked about how by his stripes we are healed, and we know that verse. It's a very, very familiar verse uh, that's in our subtext today. And that means that by his stripes we are healed, that, that relationship that was broken, that relationship that was broken with God in the Garden of Eden is now healed. By his stripes, by his suffering, our sin is now healed in the eyes of God. That's really important. By his stripes we are healed. Our spiritual separation from God has been healed by the suffering and the sacrifice that he made for us on the cross that day. There were 13 different curtains at the temple. So you say, okay, so which curtain was torn? Well, it could have been just the curtains at the entrance to the inner temple. That was in public view. But what it says in here is that it's far more likely that the curtain was split apart was the one that separated off the most sacred place, the Holy of Holies. It was pulled back just once a year on the Day of Atonement when the high priest would go in and offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people. See, only one person was allowed to go into that Holy of Holies. It was not accessible by anybody else. It wasn't accessible by you and I back in that day. Nor would it be. Only one person had the ability to go in and offer that sin sacrifice for God. And now, by the death of It opened wide. The people could see in to the Holy of Holies. The barrier between the people and God was gone. One person made the sacrifice to open that veil forever. By his stripes, we are healed. So what did the signs of darkness and the tearing of the curtain mean? Well, there's two major things that that means. The darkness was a sign of judgment from God. The sin of the whole world was laid upon Jesus and God's displeasure at the human rebellion and the failure was displayed at the removal of the Son's light. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he spoke of the great day of the Lord and quoted the prophet Joel's word, that the day would be preceded by the sun turning to darkness. And we can find that in Acts 2.20 and in Joel 2.2. Joel it was a day of darkness and gloom, a day of thick clouds and deep blackness. And then suddenly, like the dawn spreading across the mountains with a great and mighty army appears, nothing like that had ever been seen before or will ever be seen again. Other prophets like Amos and Zephaniah said the same things. God's power was shown by the shutting down of the light. God's wrath was shown like the blackness of the sky before a storm strikes. And if you were out and about yesterday, you noticed that that, that sky up there was turning mighty, mighty, mighty dark. And it was ominous because you didn't know what was happening, what was happening next when the storm was going to come. What would happen? Jesus was crucified. God plunged the land in darkness as a sign of his anger against a sinful world. Number two, the tearing of the curtain was a sign of hope. A sign of hope. See, it wasn't a sign just for the people present there. It is a sign of hope for all of us into the future. The Holy of Holies was barred to almost everyone, but now a door through the curtain was being created by the death of God's one and only Son. Sinful men and women would no longer be barred from God's presence. Jesus was bearing their sin, and the way to get back to God was open to all that followed him. All that followed him. With both of these signs, God was sending a very powerful message 
one part of the message was is that sin matters sin matters sin is never ignored or set aside as if it had no consequence whatsoever our sin means something it means something to god there's a lot of people who live their lives out today as though sin had no consequence whatsoever but see the thing about it is at some point in time we all have to atone for our sins if we have faith in christ jesus if we have faith in the lord if we follow jesus as it says in here if we follow jesus see he's already atoned for our sins how would you like to get the pe person to be that had no jesus in their life and they come up to that day of judgment and they have to stand before the lord and they got to say hey here i am see the people are going to be separated in two categories one are going to go to heaven the others are going to be eternally heated. The scriptures tell us all about it. Which place do you want to be? Life ends eternity where? The penalty for sin had to be paid, and it was being paid on the cross by Jesus. And the other part of the message is that God declared all access. So if you ever had a backstage pass to go back before the concert, you had an all access pass. You got to go wherever you wanted to go. There's nothing barring you from that. And so now the people, through Jesus' death on the cross, they've got an all-access pass to God. All those who had faith and would trust in His Son would once more be in fellowship with God. The really important part of this message is no one with faith, no one for whom Jesus is Lord, will be shut out, will be separated. No one, Jews, Gentiles, no one would be shut out. You didn't have to go through that high priest to bring a sacrifice to God for your sins. It was paid by Jesus on the cross. See, and the neat part is, God welcomes us to be where he is through Christ Jesus. The separation between God and his people were gone. And the big bullet point today is what could never be forgotten is that Jesus died. Luke's description is very concise. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into my hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Verse 46 of what I read you earlier. Jesus died quoting the words from Psalm 31, 5. And the Jews throughout the area, he, there's a reason for everything. He quoted that verse because the Jews finished their day every day quoting Psalm 31, 5. It was their evening prayer. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. That was their closing prayer for the day. Interesting that enough is it seems like it's a quiet prayer. And quietness would not be appropriate for someone who was about to die from crucifixion. Because, see, they would hardly be able to say anything. But Jesus wasn't quiet. Jesus was no ordinary man. Luke says, Jesus called out in a loud voice. His words committing his spirit to God were no final groan, but a shout of ex exultation and triumph. And that done, Luke says, he breathed his last. Jesus died. What could not be forgotten that day was that Jesus died. But he died with where is purpose? Each and every one of us. The record made by Luke and all the gospel writers show one thing clearly that Jesus was in control until the very end. Yes, he was in great agony and yes, he sensed God's distance from himself. But no one stole his life away. No one cut short his days. 
Jesus voluntarily surrendered his spirit to God and breathed his last. He voluntarily gave up his spirit. He voluntarily died on the cross. John 19.30 says that after Jesus was offered the sponge with sour wine, Jesus said, it was finished. And he gave up his spirit. It is finished. He gave up his spirit. Now notice one thing that I, I want to say again here, and I mentioned it the other day. He said, it is finished. His sacrifice was final, but his works would go on. Jesus said, it is finished. He didn't say, it's over. He didn't say it was over. The commission stands to all who accept him as Lord and Savior. The commission that he gave his disciples in Matthew 28, and Terry talked about that last week. Go into all nations, making disciples of all men. And furthermore, he told them that all the things that God had given to him, he now gave to us. All of the power. And then the last and final piece of that was, and lo, I will be with you even to the end of the age. So that commission stands as much for us today to accept him as Lord and Savior as it did for the disciples 2,000 years ago. So what does that mean for us? What do we do now? And I'm sure even the disciples were asking themselves the same thing. See, this huge stark change just came into the world, into their lives. And it's going to cause anyone to have some kind of consternation, some kind of anxiousness, some kind of confusion. Because here was their Savior, the guy who was going to save his people, and he died on the cross. And so they're going, oh, what's next? And if we take that kind of into our context today, in today's world, the movie industry usually makes heroes look like they're always in control. And of course, one of my favorites, my wife will tell you, is James Watt. <laughs> See, he never seems anxious, never looks disheveled, never appears lost for the next thing to do. Because even if he's taken prisoner, even <laughs> if he is caught by surprise, he always has some kind of gadget. Or a plan to get out of trouble and to defeat his enemy. And the only problem with that is that's fiction. That's fiction. That's not a real world experience. The rest of us often wonder what to do next. Or we're completely confused by our circumstances. Sometimes we bounce back, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes we bounce back. Sometimes we don't. None of us can ever say that we've lived our life always in control. Wow. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be a change? <laughs> yeah. We oftentimes are left wondering what comes next. What do we do now? So here we are today wondering what to do next. Can you imagine what was going through the minds of the disciples at that point in time in their lives? Luke tells us they were there standing at some distance away from Jesus on the cross were those who knew him and including men and women who had followed him from Galilee and they were there watching these things. Well, at least they were there. Because Jesus' closest disciples had fled when Jesus was arrested and most of them stayed hidden. But women who supported Jesus for some time and a few others were there witnessing this at a distance. To be a follower of a person being crucified, see, was a risk to themselves, to their personal safety. They could be arrested or even put to death. Most of us also would have stayed in the back. Yet they saw it all. Perhaps 
they're the ones who passed by and passed on all those accounts which the gospel writers were able to set down and write later on. They were the eyewitnesses. It's hard to imagine their sorrow. Their dreams died with Jesus on Calvary. Most of them had given up everything to follow him and they believed that he was the Messiah, the one that God would send to transform Israel. And such a catastrophic disappointment easily leads to that disillusionment and sometimes into depression. But that was Friday. Sunday's coming. But as yet they didn't know what a Sunday would be like. They didn't know what to expect anymore. All they knew that their dreams had died on the cross with Jesus. They didn't know about Sunday. They didn't know about the good news. What were they to do now? This was a bad Friday. This bad Friday was really good Friday. There's one final sad point to note that the followers of Jesus had always known that the one being crucified was a good, a decent, an innocent man. The vast majority of the crowd eventually realized what a terrible thing that they had done. And that Roman centurion praised God and told everyone that Jesus was a righteous man. They all saw it and they all knew it. All that is except for the Jewish leaders. And it took a Roman wearied by war and tragically familiar with crucifying his enemies to declare what everyone there should have known. This Jesus was a good man. This was God's man. But out of order, our own self-interest, spiritually darkened minds, those who should have been leaders of the faith and leaders of their nation could not grasp it. They couldn't let themselves believe that they were wrong and that Jesus had always been right. They couldn't bear the magnitude of that recognition. So Jesus died. In our Easter message, we talked about that in order to have God's plan come to fruition, several things needed to be prevailed. God's will needed to prevail. Two people had to submit totally to God's will. Judas when he betrayed Jesus and Jesus when he gave himself up to be sacrificed. If they didn't submit to the will of God, there wouldn't have been a sequence of events necessary to fulfill the salvation of all mankind. See, at that point in time, it's end of story. It's end of story. But what did happen was so significant it changed the lives of everyone literally for eternity. <coughs> Whether they choose to accept it or believe it themselves, the salvation is offered freely to all, regardless of if they are worthy, regardless of what they have or have not done. The sacrifice of Jesus, a blood sacrifice, an innocent and blameless man was made as the final atonement needed to satisfy God's own requirements set forth in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus. See, there are five different types of sacrifices that were required under the law. I'm going to concentrate on just a couple of them here today, or else we'd be here till 4 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, we will concentrate on the sacrifice for sin. And they had two different definitions of sin. That which was intentional... And that was, was unintentional. Both required specific items to be sacrificed. And there were two mandatory sacrifices in Old Testament law. The first was a sin offering. And the purpose of the sin offering was to atone for sin and cleanse yourself from defilement. Because that sin defiled you. It made you an unclean person. And you needed that sacrifice in order to be clean again. There were five possible elements to that sin sacrifice. To 
depending upon what your stature was, your financial situation, depended upon what you had to bring forward. Could be a young bull, a male goat, a female goat, a dove or a pigeon, or a one-tenth ephah of fine flour. The type of animal depended upon the identity and the financial situation of the giver. A female goat was the offering, sin offering for a common person. Fine flour was a sacrifice for the very, very poor. And a young bull was offered for the high priest and the congregation as a whole and so on and so on to require to fulfill that Levitical law. The commonality was that all of these were to be clean. They were all to be without blemish. The other mandatory sacrifice was the trespass offering and this sacrifice was exclusively a ram. The trespass offering was a given as an atonement for unintentional sins, those that required reimbursement for an offended party, and also as a cleansing from that defilement of sin or physical maladies. The sacrifices in the Old Testament pointed towards the perfect and final sacrifice of Christ. As with the rest of the law, the sacrifices were a shadow of those things yet to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. He was blameless. He was sinless. He was an innocent. And he was sacrificed as the final atonement for all sin, intentional or unintentional. Colossians 2, 13 through 15 says, You were dead because of your sins, and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. And see, that's what we did on Good Friday here is we, we had a service to where we took our sins, those things that we needed to give up, and we nailed them to the cross. And then I took them and I burned them. No one read them. That was between you and God. You offered your sins up on the cross to God. And now they became like ash. And they are more. Christians today recognize Christ atoning for death on the cross as the only needed sacrifice for sin. Offered once and for all. Our call to worship today tells us of the sacrifice Jesus made for us and why. Hebrews 10, 8 through 10. First, Christ said, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they are required by the law of Moses. Then he said, Look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second covenant in effect. For God's will was made for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Christ Jesus once and for all. And in Jesus' final words to his disciples the, prior to his ascension, he gives us that answer of what are we supposed to do next. Well, we have work to do. Period. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, Jesus gave his life for a great purpose. For God's plan. For the salvation of so many, including us here today. Nothing that happened on Calvary was ever outside of God's control. And even the blindness and wickedness of the enemies of God ultimately helped his purpose to be fulfilled. We are to go and tell the world, not just any story, but the good news of hope, of life. Of purpose, of 
God's unending love for us. We need to honor what Jesus did for us. So, does Easter matter? Yes. Now go and tell the whole world. Dear God, help us to live a life of faith that is devoted to you. We want to have a heart that pursues you before anything else. And you said if we seek you with all of our hearts, we will find you. Help us to keep our focus on you and your will. Align our will with yours and help us to keep your commands. Lord, we want to live a life of obedience and faithfulness to you. Help us not to fall into temptation and sin. Forgive us for the times that we have stumbled, and thank you for your forgiveness and love. We want to change and live by your way, Lord. You are merciful, and we know that you will not let us be temptations beyond what we can bear. And I pray that you would provide a way out for us whenever we face those temptations. And the courage to turn away from them. And whenever temptation and sin knock at the door, help us to focus instead on your goodness and love so that we can resist them. Lord, we pray for strength whenever we face difficulties. And in those times that just simply overwhelm us, we lift each worry and burden to you because we know that you are greater than anything we might face. Remind us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens. May we gain strength from doing what brings you joy. May we pray to live a life of discipline. Teach us how to be good stewards and guard the hours and minutes that you've entrusted us with so that we use our time wisely. We pray that the desires of our hearts will be aligned with yours so that we can shed our unhealthy habits. Thank you for being our strength our protection, and our provider, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray today. Amen. Thank you, Mark. I don't know about anybody else, but there was one thing that I heard in there, and they did, you didn't say it specifically. But he knew. Jesus knew. In fact, it was recorded in Matthew and the other Gospels. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. And the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. The evening would go on and they would finish their meal and they would go out to the garden. Jesus would go out and he would pray and Judas would betray him. He knew. But on the night that he was betrayed, he still took the bread and he still broke it. And he still said, this is my body, broken for you. Take. Later in the meal, he took the cup, and after blessing it, blessing it, he's, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the sins of many. Take and drink. We are reminded in Scripture that as often as we do this, we do so in remembrance of him. The body of Christ. blood of Christ shed for you. Heavenly 
Father, we thank you for what this meal represents. And each time as we share in this sacrament, Father, we're reminded that Jesus knew. But as he said in his prayers to you at the garden, not your will, or not my will, but yours. Father, let us take this message that we have heard today and let us share that message because it is a message of hope. Thank you, Father, for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. I definitely miss the niece today because normally I'd just go sit down and she would come up and she would uh, be with us, but we know that they're traveling and, and seeing Steve's mom, and so we just pray for their safe travel uh, back home again, and we look forward to seeing them the next time that we gather. Are there any prayers that you would like to offer up or any praises that we need to, to announce? I'd like to lift up Melba Nellens. serious health conditions right now and she could really use all the prayers that we can give. Um, and you guys might know her from Emmaus. So uh, I'd like to lift her up today. Lord, hear our prayer. of a loved one is never easy even when you know it's coming. Well, Father, we come before you right now and we lift up Melba and we lift up Kylie's uh, family. We pray for healing for Melba. We pray for comfort and peace for Kylie's family. Father, we pray for safe travel for Denise and Steve. We pray for those who are not here with us today, Father, for whatever reason Father, we thank you again for the technology that you provide that this message can reach all corners of the world that have the ability to watch something online. Father, we thank you for this place. And Father, we, again, we thank you for the warmth that you have provided in here. But more importantly, Father, we thank you for the warmth that you give us through your word. For the grace, the love, the mercy, and the forgiveness that you have given to us. Father, let us see adversity as a challenge that we can look to you to get us through, that we don't walk through it alone. Guide and direct us, Father, in this ministry. <clears throat> Show us what it is that you have for us. And thank you for the opportunity each and every week that when we come together that we can pray Jesus' name. Amen. This is going to be the end of our online portion of our service. We've got some music and things to follow here. But receive this benediction. God grant to the living grace and to the departed rest, to the nation peace and harmony to us all. God grant to us, your servants, the promise of everlasting life, a light to guide us on our way, courage to support each other in grace and in mercy. God, we ask for your blessing to unite us all in service to you, to our God, and to this church. Let us go forth into the world in peace and hope.
and love, wholly dedicated to your service, Lord. Let us hold fast to which is good, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the needy and the afflicted, and honor all people. Let us love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of his Spirit. May God's blessing be upon all of us and remain with us always. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray today.